Hello, hello, Mordimers here and welcome to another game, famous game of Judith Polgar. This time I would like to show you um, the game from the match between Russia and the rest of the world uh, in 2002 played in Moscow. Uh, and this was pretty iconic match because that was the third edition uh, and it was quite symbolical because uh, in 1970 during the first edition Soviet Union players played against the rest of the world and they uh, actually won by the small margin but uh, but they won that was the match of the century and then in the second edition in 1984 Soviet Union won again uh, and this is the third edition where Russia plays so no more Soviet Union uh, it was erased uh, from the maps However, a lot of players who could potentially play for the Soviet Union played for the rest of the world. So, for example, Alexei Shirov, who played for the Spain at that time, uh, he was the part of the representation of the of the rest of the world, and also Boris Gelfand, who was playing for um, for Israel, uh, Vasily Ivanchuk for for Ukraine, or Timur Rajabov for Azerbaijan. So, a lot of superstars um, were actually playing for the rest of the world team and I would like to show you the game of Judith Polgar she was 26 years old at that time and plays against a super legend Gary Kasparov 39 years old however he was still dominating the the all the tournaments at that time uh, starting from I think 1985 until end of his career in 2005 he was you know dominating uh, all the tournaments for two decades so definitely he was the favorite of this game uh, and also Gary Kasparov won a lot of games against Judith Polgar so far so uh, without further ado let's see what happened during this uh, this game during this historical and iconic you know Russia versus the rest of the world uh, match and uh, just for your information the match was won by the representation of the rest of the world so that's what that's why it's it's quite symbolical it's end of some era of domination of the Soviet players as you see as the Empire broke and then also the players started to play for for different countries and then we have more diverse representations nowadays in 21st century so uh, Judith Polgar open with e4 we have e5 by Gary Kasparov knight on f3 knight on c6 bishop on b5 so Rui Lopez on the board and here Gary Kasparov went for knight on f6 Berlin defense quite a surprise because especially at the beginning of the 21st century it was considered as the as the very drawish opening so uh, nowadays d3 is played very often by Magnus Carlsen by Hikaru Nakamura we've seen that couple of times in 2020 so I show a couple of games with that system uh, and then bishop on c5 and the game continues However, at that time, the most popular move was the castle. And this is still considered as the main line. So after knight on e4, rook on e1 is the, is the threat. So d4 is the, is the first move to, to, to consider. And then knight on d6 with the attack on the bishop. Uh, and white, if you don't want to, you know, waste the tempo, just exchange the, the light square bishop. So bishop on c6, d takes on c6. And after d on e5, knight on f5. Five and white can actually exchange the queens so queen on d8 uh, king on d8 and black cannot do castle however has the pair of bishop and the and the bishop can be pretty powerful here uh, however believe me or not the main line after knight on c3 this was played by Judith Polgar the main line looks like that king on e8 first uh, just to avoid any checks and then after h3 preparing a g4 h5 is the main idea just to you know prevent that move uh, and then bishop on f4, bishop on e7, normal development, rook a on d1, bringing the rook to the center. Uh, and after bishop on e6, this is one of the of the ways to develop that bishop. Knight g5, attacking the bishop, trying to exchange. Uh, and after, for example, uh, rook on h6, there are no, uh, you know, very uh, fancy discoveries here. So the knight could go, for example, to f3 or just take the, the bishop, but then the rook just pick up and on e6 it's a very strong rook uh, and everything is fine with the position the black doesn't need
need to do castle anymore uh, if needed can go to for example f8 and everything is fine and it was believe me or not 88 percent of the games ended in a draw so uh, it's a it's a very draw which is very difficult to actually win but here after knight on c3 gary kasparov goes for a different idea h6 taking away the square g5 from the knight so the knight cannot jump in the future over there uh, but now you did goes for this line rook on d1 with check king on e8 and now h3 still preparing g4 uh, and now it would be pretty stupid to, to play this these two moves with the with the pawn so usually it's not played this way but rather bishop on e7 with the idea of controlling h4 so this knight can actually be exchanged for for the knight on f3 uh, and this bishop instead of coming to e6 can actually come to f5 and from f5 can attack this c2 and can be very, it can be very unpleasant as this pawn cannot be pushed so because of that knight on e2 is played by Judith Polgar so now uh, this pawn can be moved freely for example to c4 or c3 uh, and also this knight can move to d4 uh, and attack e6 but also uh, f5 if the knights are, are exchanged if not then the knight can come to f4 uh, and still you know keep a control on e6 so it will be very difficult to actually develop the, the bishop on e6 without the exchanging uh, and here one of the ideas for black is actually b6 so don't bring the bishop uh, don't exchange the, this light square bishop as this is one of the most important assets uh, and bishop on e6 and after g4 exchange the knights very traditional way uh, of approaching that and after knight on f4 play bishop on b7 so this bishop can stay actually on this diagonal this bishop can stay here very active and uh, this is one of the ways which could be played Gary Kasparov goes for a uh, more traditional played many times knight on h4 uh, and we have knight on h4 bishop on h4 uh, and now bishop on e3 developing the bishop bishop on f5 with the attack on c2 but now simply knight d4 defending um, the pawn on c2 but also attacking the bishop so this is very critical moment of the game where would you move this bishop uh, if you are Gary Kasparov it looks like very logical if you make move h6 then why not to move the bishop on h7 however um, you know after game analysis uh, prove that bishop on d7 would be much better because uh, after g4 uh, g6 can be played very easily and this knight cannot reach f5 very important outpost for white and this is the idea uh, of bringing this knight you know this way and um, to bring it to f5 so so that's the plan for white however here it's not possible uh, we have bishop on h7 but now g4 by Judith Polgar and g6 is not longer possible because the pawn on h6 is hanging so that would not be possible also look at this bishop bishop on h7 looking at g6 a uh, completely passive piece this is why this bishop you know uh, at this moment should go to d7 it would be you know it would still control f5 so it would be much better uh, so after g4 we have bishop on e7 by Gary Kasparov and now king on g2 so bringing the king uh, to support the pawns majority attack on the on the king side and now h5 Gary Kasparov doesn't wait for that he counter attack he wants to bring the rook to the game uh, and then continue this way uh, we have knight on f5 very natural move attacking g7 and also uh, attacking them the bishop on g7 so so asking Kasparov, uh, may I actually exchange the, the knight for one of your bishops? Gary Kasparov doesn't agree because this is his only asset now. So bishop on f8. He wants to keep the pair of bishop. We have king on f3. So bringing the, the king even closer. And now bishop on g6. Preparing, exchanging the pawns. And then the rook can be activated, for example, to h3. Uh, and here Judith Polgar doesn't care about that and plays rook on d2 preparing to to double the rooks we have h takes on g4 h takes on g4 and now rook on h3 and now although uh, king on e4 could be possible but but look at this uh, the knight would be pinned so that's the first thing and also this rook left behind and uh, 
maybe Garry Kasparov could get some active play. So uh, Judith prefers to play it safe and plays king on g2, kicking the rook. So we have rook on h7 and now improve the position of the king to g3. Uh, very important move. Otherwise, if she tries to uh, double the rooks immediately, that would be really really bad for example rook a on d1 and look at this bishop on f5 g takes on f5 and rook on h5 attacking these pawns and they cannot just be defended so uh the only way may be f6 but it's still you know really bad for for white g takes on f6 e takes on f6 now bishop on d6 and look at this the king can go to to d7 this rook can be activated and black has a really great um, you know gameplay on the on the queen side so uh, this would be just too early first king on g3 and now if the bishop wants to exchange there is no tricks anymore here because king g4 attacks the rook defends the, the pawn on f5 so everything is is pretty fine so king on g3 and now f6 so gary kasparov wants to uh, bring his pieces to the game because for now this knight this one knight paralyzed two of the bishops this bishop actually defends g7 for now the rook as well and also this bishop is is blocked so if white decide to exchange the pawns this rook which is limited on the on the h file could get for example somewhere on the on the seven rank so uh, gary kasparov tries to open the position but Judith doesn't agree and plays bishop on f for the best move in the position and now e6 can be very annoying the pawn gonna stay on e6 and black has to you know pay attention and also the c7 pawn gonna be under attack which is not so easy to defend uh, this rook would have to stay uh, on c8 which is not you know the dream spot for the for the rook so here kasparov uh, decided okay it's time to exchange my bishops they're not gonna be fully operational so my only assets actually uh, is gone bishop on f5 and this this knight is just too strong here so bishop on f5 g takes on f5 and now f takes on e5 and instead of taking the pawn rook on e1 pinning the the pawn so the pawn going nowhere we have bishop on d6 creating some shelter for the king and it looks like black gonna have very nice counterplay you know on the h file uh, and it can be very dangerous however it's just look like that because after bishop on e5 king on d7 as planned white has actually c4 very dangerous move because c5 is coming so black are forced actually to play c5 but now bishop on d6 forcing uh, to create the weakness on d6 and of course rook on e6 with the double attack on the d6 and the pawn cannot be defended if the rook is moved for example to h6 simply rook d on d6 with check uh, and then winning yet another pawn over there uh, and these two pawns of course gonna gonna win the game for for white so not this way kasparov tries to be as much active as possible as you already know uh, you know in the end game especially the rook end game activity is the key However, it's too late. Rook A on H8, uh, and it looks like black gonna have some counterplay, but now simply Rook E on D6, we have King on C8, uh, and now Rook from the second rank to D5, attacking C5. So uh, Kasparov uh, delivers some checks, Rook on H3, King on G2, Rook on H2, King on F3, Rook from the second rank to H3, and now Judith Polgar just improves the position of the King, king on e4 uh, and now b6 so defending the c5 but it doesn't matter much because rook on c6 with check and now if kasparov goes for uh, king on b7 there is a problem because rook on g6 uh, and if the pawn is defended then actually uh, rook on d7 uh, with double attack and again uh, the same position uh, black gonna win with this double pawn so for example this way and this pawn's just gonna win the game so Kasparov goes for king on b8 however now simply rook on d7 double the rooks on the 7 rank and that's the plan for the game we have rook on h2 now going after the pawns on the on the second rank however it's just uh, not enough Judith simply goes back with the king she didn't need to she's faster here however she doesn't want uh, you know to give Kasparov any even uh, a little counterplay and plays king on e3 
Uh, we have rook on f8 going after the pawn on f5. However, this is uh, completely not, uh, you know, scary. So rook c on c7 and after rook on f5, we have rook on b7 delivering the check. So king on c8, now rook d on c7 with check, king d8 and now rook on g7 threatening the checkmate from this side and this side. So the only move is king on c8 and also in this position, Gary Kasparov resigned and he resigned because... Uh, in the next move, white just simply gonna take the, the pawn on a7 uh, and king on b8 is forced, otherwise would be a checkmate. Uh, and then rook a on f7 and now checkmate gonna be delivered on, on g8, otherwise um, the rook on f5 is hanging, so uh, black would be forced to actually exchange the rooks. And this is of course completely winning for white. Uh, white has two extra pawns, so, so for example, uh, these pawns can be exchanged here, this pawn can be put then the king can just go to, to c6, win another pawn, there are a lot of uh, mating uh, threats also uh, on the 8th rank, so uh, this is completely unplayable. This is why in this position Gary Kasparov just resigned. So very beautiful game and success of Judith Polgar, she won um, against Gary Kasparov, so congratulations just 18 years later and, uh, and yeah, if you like this, this game, press like, if for some reason you don't like it, press and like and if you don't want to miss any other quality games on my channel press subscribe smash the bell button thanks for watching and see you in the next one